Hi everybody, this is AJ Heitman, the Editor-in-Chief of GEMS, and welcome to today's webcast, Overcoming the Fear Factor of Treating Pediatric Patients. In this webcast, sponsored by Laird Ald, you're going to learn about the psychology behind taking care of pediatric patients in the pre-hospital setting. Why does it make us so anxious and uh, we make it more challenging than it has to be? That's what we're going to address today. Participants, you're also going to discover how simulation can be used to help EMTs and medics conquer this fear of treating children and young patients. First, let me go over a couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, this presentation is both live and interactive, so you can ask questions at any time by clicking on the Ask a Question button in the presentation window. We'll answer questions during Q&A portion at the end, and Sarah Ferguson and I will be triaging those and maybe merging a few of them. So don't be afraid to uh, put something down. Um, today's webcast includes streaming video. So once the video appears and begins playing, you can enlarge the video player by clicking on the double arrows at the bottom right-hand corner. If you're running a pop-up blocking software, you'll need to disable it to view this webcast. In addition, it's recommended that you close all other applications for better performance. If you have some quirks that are going on or you have a problem, just type it into the Q&A area and uh, our staff in Tulsa is waiting to rectify those problems for you, so don't worry about it. At the end of the webcast, you're going to see a short survey that's going to appear on your screen. If you want to receive your hour of uh, CAPC approved continuing ed, you must complete that evaluation. It's real quick. You'll be emailed a CE certificate in a few days, and Con Ed is only available for those who attend the live event and isn't available if you're watching the archived event. For your convenience, though, we are going to have this available on demand within 24 hours. And a reminder, email message will be sent to all of you with a link to the archive. It will also be archived at gems.com slash webcast, so you can share it with your friends, and I'm sure you'll want to do that. We're also, uh, uh, with the courtesy of the speaker, is going to have a PDF available of the uh, slides, not the videos, but a PDF will be available for you. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to sponsor Lairdall for supporting today's webcast. They've been a leader in resuscitation and particular pediatric simulation for, God, decades. And uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Dr. Mark Peel is a pediatric intensivist at WakeMed in Raleigh, North Carolina, and served as medical director of the WakeMed Children's Hospital from 2009 through 2015. His clinical interests include airway management, trauma, critical care transport, traumatic brain injury, shock and sepsis, ultrasound, and procedural sedation. He has faculty appointments at the University of North Carolina and Duke University and teaches pediatric and critical care skills to learners at all levels with an interest in the use of medical simulation. He's also a pediatric advisor for us at GEMS on our editorial board and he'll be one of the authors of a really exciting uh, article that you'll see in GEMS in the next couple of months. With him is Dr. Amar Patel. He's director of the Center of Innovative Learning at WakeMed Health and Hospitals in Raleigh. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience in fire and EMS, disaster medicine, critical care transport as a firefighter, a paramedic, a researcher, and an educator. He's currently involved in simulation-based research products or projects that focus on integration and implementation of simulation and how process changes affect the healthcare delivery model. Dr. Peel is going to go first and then he will transition over to Dr. Patel. So with that, Dr. Peel, it's all yours. Okay, thanks AJ. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and talk about a topic that Amar and I care a lot about and that's helping folks overcome the fear of we're taking care of kids, particularly in the pre-hospital setting. And we can't cover it all. We could speak for hours and hours about this. Um, it's just, this will mostly be high level about the why we um, fear children in the pre-hospital setting and in the hospital setting too, and then what to do about it, particularly with the use of uh, simulation to train ourselves. And then I'll speak a little bit about some specific skills around airway management, which tends to be one of the most anxiety-producing um, things we have to do for sick kids. Um, uh, just wanted to quickly give a comment about Wake Med. Wake Med is in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's a big community hospital where Amar and I both work. This is our strategic uh, plan for the hospital, which includes, interestingly, innovation, uh, particularly using simulation to help our 
providers better take care of children. Wake Med is not Wake Forest. We love Wake Forest, but that's the University in Winston-Salem. I show this map here just to help you guys locate where we are. The red dot in the middle in Raleigh is where Wake Med Children's Hospital is. Um, this is our mobile team, our mobile critical care team that both Amar and I work with, um, and we have a, a large uh, children's uh, transport team as, as a component of that team as well. So let's get to the topic. Um, why are we afraid of taking care of kids? So some data to start with. So even though children represent probably less than 10% of all pre-hospital EMS encounters, um, they're still important, and, and because they're infrequent and they uh, present us with high-risk, low-frequency medical conditions, they can cause anxiety. In a recent survey, um, less than 30% of paramedics and EMS mm -hmm. providers stated that they felt comfortable taking care of kids, and less than 10% felt that they have comfort with pediatric medication dosing in particular. That's a big, that's a big st uh, stressor. Uh, most want more pediatric education in their um, um, professional education, and most also say that realistic simulation is one of the best ways for them to learn. You'll note we have references at the bottom of each of these slides should you want to read more about these topics. Um, so why should we learn to care better for kids? Well, a child dies every hour in the U.S. of an injury, number one. And interestingly, one pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest occur each hour. One of each of these will occur during our talk today. And guess who encounters them first? It's our EMS professionals um, who can save lives and improve outcomes for these kids with adequate preparation. Um, uh, nationally, about 10% of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients survive to hospital discharge, but those numbers can be improved with improved pre-hospital care, and I'll show you some data on that. And interestingly, um, it's been shown that more on-scene time with these kids improves survival, to, obviously to a limit. Too much time can be bad, but more on-scene time, more on -scene time um, and providing adequate emergency care can improve survival. So what do providers say are the most challenging skills they uh, encounter and would like to know more about? Well, airway management's number one. Newborn resuscitation, the subject of an article uh, AJ has asked us to produce for GEMS. Um, vascular access, particularly IV and particularly IO access in kids, the management of home ventilators, and what to do about C-spine management. And um, this again is in a uh, study out of pre-hospital emergency care in 2015. Um, what are the most challenging decisions providers face? Well, knowing when to alter plans mid-course, what if the child changes, what do I do now? Um, when to perform an advanced airway, whether and when, how to assess and treat pain, Determining whether a child is sick or not at all, that's a tough one for, ever, for all of us, and choosing the correct protocols in kids. Um, we face challenges with how to educate on, on pediatric care because requirements and educational methods vary widely by agency and by state. Um, I've chosen some quotes out of this uh, survey of pre-hospital mm -hmm. providers that, are, that illustrate the problem. Um, the first one is on education. In our class, we had a little baby head that we intubated and I felt woefully underprepared the first time I had to intubate an actual child. The same thing is true of, I, of starting IVs. How do we get better at these skills? Number two, lack of case-based learning and follow-up. What follow-up do you get after you've brought a patient to the hospital? Um, the quote from the provider was, we want to know the end result. We get the patient about two-thirds down the road and the map ends and you never see the destination. So how can hospitals, and we work on this personally and should do a better job of it, provide good follow-up and case-based education on the cases that pre-hospital providers bring to the hospital. How about barriers to maintaining skills? Uh, another quote, I've worked at this agency for three years and I've had two child codes. It's something you're never comfortable with. Right, it's going to occur rarely. Some providers may never encounter one. Sometimes it may be one a year. But it's nevertheless something that we can train to in simulation and gain more comfort with so that when the real thing happens, we're better prepared. And lastly, need to improve training. You can stare at a PowerPoint nonstop, but until you get your hands on it, it doesn't sink in. And it's going to be hard to get your hands on a lot of pediatric serious emergencies. So simulation training, uh, we think, can um, better prepare you. What about controversies? Um, how much time should people spend? Well, cardiac arrests are only, I mean, pediatric runs are only 10% of all. Should, should we spend time educating on these? Cardiac arrests are infrequent. Airway management is infrequent. And you could take a glass half full or glass half empty approach on this. 
we don't do it very often, we're not good at it, so we shouldn't learn it. Or what I would say is let's take a glass half full approach and say we're okay now, let's get better and let's provide kids better care. So then what are the best methods and most cost effective methods? Simulation can be uh, expensive. Extra time spent in training can be expensive. Um, should pre-hospital providers be providing advanced airway management? This is a big topic of controversy on which I have some fairly strong opinions. And lastly, do we uh, find the sick child in the, in, in, on the street and take them quickly to the hospital or, or provide some really important basic resuscitation and management before um, taking them to the hospital? So let's address one question in particular, probably the most anxiety provoking is should we be intubating kids? I'm citing here the well-known article from Marianne Gaucher Hill and others in LA from 2000, the year 2000, in published in JAMA, and this is often, often cited literature. And in this study, they looked at three years' worth of data, 830 pediatric patients um, um, after paramedics in LA and Orange County had received two three-hour uh, airway education sessions. And then they randomized patients to uh, either getting bag, bag valve mask ventilation only or bag valve mask ventilation plus endotracheal intubation. There was a low success rate with intubation. Um, there was a higher success rate with bag valve mask ventilation as noted by the subjective um, uh, rating of a good chest rise, which is a tough way to measure whether you're actually bagging someone well or not. They noted that 30 patients had um, a significant complication of esophageal intubation or tube dislodgement and all of those patients died and therefore the conclusion in this article was that since there were no difference in outcomes between the groups maybe we shouldn't be intubating kids because it's a hard skill and bag valve mass ventilation works just as well. However, these um, providers didn't receive ongoing education, dedicated simulation education routinely on both bag valve mask and intratracheal intubation and I'm not sure that we should conclude from this study alone that people should not be intubating kids pre-hospital, especially with cardiac arrest. Second study that's important is out of the CARES database, two-year study of almost 4,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests um, throughout the country, and they found that um, of those patients, um, they, they looked at agencies who were willing to use bag valve mask and advanced airway, which is either endotracheal tube or supraglottic, um, and they found that survival was actually greater for um, bag valve mass ventilation than it was for endotracheal intubation. Again, the, the conclusion might be, no, we shouldn't be doing it. Or the conclusion would be, let's educate ourselves better so that we do it better in the right, in the right situation. And lastly, the NEMSIS database, 40 states, almost 100,000 encounters looking at uh, airway procedures, and you see on the, in the black uh, graph that 0.3% um, of, of these cases were intubation pr procedures performed, so a low frequency procedure. Although endotracheal success rates were 81%, higher than the previous studies, and the lowest success rate was in the cardiac arrest patients. Interestingly, the patient in whom you might most need effective endotracheal intubation. If any of you would like to, to see a good course on pediatric airway management, I've put the link here. This is out of the North Carolina EMSC organization and something called the Children's Institute for Pediatric Trauma out of Wake Forest Baptist. Saveinjuredkids.org slash airway. You can take an online um, uh, pre-hospital airway management course, uh, which is well done, just as a resource to suggest to you. Okay, there are studies that show that outcomes in pre-hospital airway management are improved with intratracheal intubation, specifically a large Asian study out of Japan um, Singapore and other and <clears throat> Korea that showed that one of the most important factors in survival to hospital discharge was the placement of an advanced airway, indication that maybe we should be doing this. Um, and then two other out-of-hospital uh, cardiac arrest trials show improvement with um, longer scene time. So less than 10 minutes and greater than 30 minutes showed worse outcomes than, than providers who spent about 10 to 30 minutes in the field. Um, <clears throat> and they didn't show a difference with on whether the patient was intubated or not. So why might intratracheal intubation be helpful? Why should we learn this skill? One, most pediatric cardiac arrests occur from respiratory failure, and therefore reversing the problem that caused the arrest is, is important, and we need to provide adequate oxygenation. Providing PEEP and a stable airway is important for this, and therefore intratracheal intubation may be the preferred choice. Also, we can monitor uh, in 
in tidal CO2 more accurately with an endotracheal tube in place, and we may prevent further lung injury. Why might we argue that we shouldn't intubate patients or use endotracheal intubation? Well, the, the leading theory on why some of the studies have shown worse outcome is that we tend to interrupt our chest compressions as we put a tube in. There are both inpatient and outpatient data in pediatrics showing worse survival with endotracheal intubation, probably because we spend too long at the head of the bed intubating, therefore improving our skills, and in particular using video laryngoscopy may improve our outcomes. And then, of course, incorrect ET2 placement and a few other factors, including taking the most experienced provider out of the scene. So what do we do? What do we conclude? My conclusions are we should learn at least effective bag valve mass ventilation in kids, the most important skill you can gain. And it's not as easy and intuitive as, as you think it is. Um, and therefore, we need to train in basic resuscitation, including BVM, on sim in simulation. Um, some agencies are able to gain their providers Operating room experience, it's hard to come by, but when possible, obviously, especially if it's a hospital-owned system, it's worth lobbying for. And lastly, I would suggest that we develop skill with video laryngoscopy, which um, is, is a superior technique by many measures. So if someone trains um, effectively for endotracheal intubation, can we show success? This graph shows uh, endotracheal intubation success rates in North Carolina EMS overall, around 61% stable for the past many years. In one agency, New Hanover Regional, a dedicated system of, in, of airway management was put in place, and they were able to demonstrate um, dramatic increase in success rates up to about 95% with a combination of simulation training, OR training, and um, tailgate training, meaning frequent um, frequent retraining on pediatric and adult uh, airway management skills through simulation. Also the use of video laryngoscopy. Number two, Polk County, Florida, EMS, um, you've probably seen maybe these articles in GEMS before, um, had a low to z actually zero percent out of hospital cardiac arrest survival rate in the early uh, part of this decade, 2012, and decided we're going to do better, we're going to implement a system of stay in stay on the scene, manage the patient, use um, a, a reference and guide called the Hantevi system to help us with the medication dosing, and we're going to intubate cardiac arrest patients. And they were able to demonstrate a dramatic increase in patient survival from zero to 74% in a matter of about six to eight years. So on this slide you see at the bottom of the graph, zero survivors in the year 2012. In 2017, um, the ROSC rate was high, and they had a much higher um, intact survival rate uh, than nationally. So impressive results with dedicated simulation training and use of adequate references and intubation in the field. Okay, so I promised a quick uh, skills lesson on, on one of the many anxiety-provoking skills, which is BVM. Uh, my way of thinking through this, and this could be an entire lecture, hour or more lecture, so can't cover it all, but... Um, I think of the four P's of pediatric airway management. And one is prepare. Part of the prepare is learn in simulation. Learn to bag valve mask ventilate and place the tube in high fidelity simulation. And then on the scene, prepare with the SOAP model, which is have suction, oxygen, airway supplies, and pre-medications thought ahead and ready by weight. And again, the Hantevi system, PALS, Braslow tape can all teach you how to, uh, to prepare those if you have your pediatric supplies ready. Positioning of the head is super important in kids because they easily obstruct their airway, which I'll show you in a minute. Pre-oxygenation is always important. High flow nasal cannula at one to two liters per kilo per minute. And the concept of PEEP is super important in kids because they quickly collapse their alveoli and need PEEP by bag valve mask or endotracheal intubation uh, provided to reinflate re their lungs. So why do kids obstruct quickly? They have bigger heads and bigger tongues for the size of their airway, and you can see in these illustrations from the PALS manual how quickly a child may obstruct their airway and how the shoulder roll in younger kids under two may be important in correct positioning. I'm going to flip to a video that illustrates, um, actually, let me do one more slide first. So the importance here of airway positioning and the importance in the second slide of the jaw thrust. This is an MRI picture of a breathing child under propofol sedation, and you can see on the left-hand side, the epiglottis and the tongue are almost obstructing the back of the airway. And then I crawled up into the MRI scanner 
and gave this style to jaw thrust and repeated the scan, and you can see how much more room has been um, uh, created in the back of the throat, much more easily creating an open airway. So jaw thrust is a super important way to manage a child's airway. You'll see a video here of me um, encountering a child who is fully obstructing the airway and simply producing a jaw thrust with my hand allows him a complete uh, opening of the airway. I won't be able to talk through this, so just watch this 20 second video. Oh, that's the wrong one. Can I do it? Can I revoke it? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I uh, launched the wrong one. Okay, so that teaches you the importance of jaw thrust, and therefore, how do we bag correctly? Um, PALS teaches us, not, not wrongly, but it's not the best technique, I believe, something called the EC clamp, which you'll notice with my hand and the anesthesiologist's hand in these pictures, is producing a closed mouth. And I'm actually, with fingers under the jaw, pushing the tongue up against the roof of the mouth, doing the exact opposite of what I want. I'm not able to create an oral airway by this method. So I teach and said something called the the VE clamp. The V of your thumb and forefinger hold the mask, and the E of your remaining three fingers produce a jaw thrust under the angle of the mandible. This allows you a great mask seal. You can tilt the head exactly correctly to undo the posterior pharyngeal obstruction, and you can create a jaw thrust all at one time. And you'll see the technique shown now in these uh, videos. Both of these are in mannequins. Um, the first one will look like a real infant, but it's actually a mannequin. And I'm going to demonstrate both correct and incorrect technique. Who visits the hospital? Okay, go ahead. I got this. Are they realistic? Are they positional or why are they all fractured? These were concept babies. Oh, so this was an idea to say, did people buy these when they were like it? So it's. I see. Yeah. Okay. Here's uh, one more picture of the, uh, of the technique, and I'll show you again in a final video. Note in this one that we will have the peep valve attached to the bag. So just the point there is that I'm trying to, I can manage that child's airway very nicely um, by correct head positioning, creating a jaw thrust, and gentle back valve mass ventilation with a peep valve. That is a skill that can be life-saving even if you do not feel comfortable intubating um, a pediatric patient. So would love to talk more about uh, airway management, and hopefully we can do that in another session, AJ. But I'm, I'm going to turn over to Amar now. Um, how to broadly use simulation to improve our skills. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, and so I think there's a lot of questions that we have to ask as we go through this. And, and to what Mark had pointed out earlier, simulation can be, uh, can be extremely effective. And there can be, obviously, cost, uh, uh, cost tied to this that prohibit us from actually using it in a larger scale. But it, it's important for us to really focus uh, first on the foundational knowledge tied to simulation. And so to be more confident and confident using simulation as a method to be able to teach pediatrics, I think it's important that we start with the educator first. And it's really a multi-step approach where we have to ensure that the educator is themselves confident and confident in the skills that they are training individuals. At times, that may involve soliciting external expertise to help train our providers. 
so and you know really some some areas may not have access to those providers. So how do we do that? Uh, I live in this world of innovation, and you know part of my other hat is to oversee innovation at Wake Med. And so I really em embrace this power of doing something new and doing something different. And so when we look at this local innovation model, we see how innovation can be highly effective. Uh, you can make it easily replicable. It's culturally appropriate and locally sustainable. When I think about that in a scenario design standpoint in the world of simulation, I want to create an educational experience that's highly effective. I can easily duplicate it. It's culturally appropriate to the area and the environment that I'm working in, and it is locally manageable. If I come out and bring external simulation to my community and they can't continue to manage that, it's a one-off, it's impossible to maintain, and as providers change within those areas, the problems that we previously faced will continue to be faced by that organization. So it's important that, that whatever education we bring into the area or whatever education you create can be managed long-term and is easy to be able to do so. So, I, you know, for a sec, as we talk about simulation, I do want us to focus on, on developing fear and anxiety. And I think the management, you know, as a paramedic, one of my biggest fears was getting that 2 o'clock in the morning cardiac arrest call of that pediatric patient or the 8 a.m. pediatric uh, cardiac arrest call. And it's important for us as educators to embrace the fact that there is fear um, of the situation and there and and. People are scared, and it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be scared going into a training environment. It's okay to experience the unknown. As educators, it's important for us to embrace that fear and talk about that fear. A failure in healthcare is driven by poor communication, a lack of teamwork, and frankly, ignorance. Um, and so, you know, as educators, it's important for us to look at at what the expectations are and how do we balance failure with success as we're training the new generation of, of providers across uh, the world. So the other piece of this that I think simulation is key to do is intra-professional education. And it's imperative that if we tend to work together, uh, that we must be able to train together. Working and training in silos does not really do us any good. Those emergent calls that we get for, for uh, uh, PED seizures, you know, we have external folks coming to bail us out all the time. You may have fire personnel or other first responders on scene. And if you're taking care of that individual, training with that core group is important to ensure that you have what's developed as a shared mental model in, in the care delivery process. So the other piece of this that I think uh, you know um, is important in training, especially in simulation training, is mindfulness. And mindfulness training allows us to focus. It allows us to really hammer on observing the present moment as it is, and by doing so, we're able to really pay attention at, at the present moment, and we're able to do so without uh, without other judgments in mind. Whenever we bring awareness to what is happening directly in front of us, it heightens your senses. And it allows your state of mind to focus on on the present state, and you do so in a uh, in a more thoughtful and arguably mindful manner. So mindfulness is is key. I implore you, if you're doing any education out there and you're focusing on these high risk, low yield skills, is to train your individuals to have some of that mindfulness training. It will help them um, down the road as they're as they're in those crucial situations where time and focus are extremely important. I, you know, like Dr. Peel, I pointed out, uh, I did my own little uh, literature perusal of where simulation in pediatrics plays, an, uh, plays that important role. Um, there are citations on the bottom of this, uh, this slide. Um, take a look at these studies. They're, they're key to understanding how valuable simulation can be in pediatric education. What was interesting when taking a look at, the, at these three specific studies was the, uh, the, the same things kept popping up again. The individuals that were, that were evaluated during the studies or the studies looked at uh, retrospective uh, data really highlighted that there needs to be a focus on, the, on potential use of simulation um, as an avenue to practice procedural skills. Remember that repetition and practice are key to success, especially in those high anxiety, high stressful situations. Uh, there was a huge focus on this combination of lectures followed by simulation training, so more of a hybrid approach where you get a lot of cognitive as well as a lot of practical experience to drive it forward. And I'll show you a little bit of, of that, this mastery learning curve or this mastery learning style that plays this integral role of lecture with simulation. One of the biggest barriers that people pointed out in the studies was the quality of training. 
and individuals felt like the higher the quality of training, the more comfortable they were, the more confident they were, the more competent they were. Uh, the lower yield, the, the lower quality training really did not help them in their day-to-day -day work. And so the quality of training is extremely important when we're looking at, at value add at the end of the day. And lastly, highly realistic simulation training was the best, and that was reiterated throughout the studies um, as well. And I think that's imperative that we see that, you know, from personal experience in, in, in being an EMS provider as well as a, a simulationist, uh, that we've seen that correlate uh, where we've gone out and done some education uh, and seen the impact it's had on patient care and, and on outcomes in counties and jurisdictions. And then, you know, as a, as a provider, my own self doing the train, uh, taking my own training, um, we see that that change for me as well, where I'm not in the street every day, um, more in a lab environment. And so, for me to touch a patient, that simulation plays a huge role for me to be comfortable and competent across the board. Fidelity. This, you know, this question often comes up of, of how realistic does it need to be to, to garner the same um, level of stress. And remember that we define fidelity as something that is simulation replicates a real event. It can be a really simple situation, but it, it's enough to trigger the individual to believe that they're in that real event. So something as simple as doing the, uh, and you know, for those of you that have been around a little while, the registry had the oral boards where essentially you had to verbally walk through your case scenario and describe in, in detail what you would do. This is, that is a high level of fidelity. If you can imagine the environment in, in which you're in and verbally talk through not only your assessment, but as well as your step-by-step -step care management, that is increasing the level of fidelity. Um, and you know, the goal of this is to reproduce the reactions, interactions, and responses of that real world like. So if I'm doing an active shooter scenario in simulation, is it the same level of, of, of fidelity as it would be if I actually had to live through that? And how do we create similarities both in emotional response as well as reactions? Training, the training environment has to create that realistic because we have to understand where our own weaknesses are to, to be able to build on those weaknesses, grow ourselves, and be able to have a direct impact in the care that we deliver. So there are a lot of tools that are available to you to help increase fidelity. Um, and today, you know, it's a pretty crazy environment where we're now uh, pushing the, the scope of uh, adding virtual reality and augmented reality and mixed reality into it. Um, if you ever get a chance to look at some of those training tools that are out there, they're pretty realistic. Um, you know, the challenges that you often run into is some of the haptics where it's, it's odd to be in this little bubble and to interact with that, that virtual spatial area. It's getting better every day. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at some of those different tools. They offer great um, value to, to some of the training environments. And sometimes they're far cheaper than, than what's available in terms of high fidelity simulation, um, in terms of uh, mannequin-based simulation. Uh, and, and oftentimes you can partner with individuals that are doing some of this as, as testers. You have the ability to do full or partial simulation, part task trainers. There's tons and tons of online training tools that are out there. Dr. Peel mentioned one that was available as an error training tool. Um, and then, you know, there's options with the, the lecture-based PowerPoint uh, experiences, or I would encourage you to use case-based studies where you actually have a group of learners in a classroom environment, and you're actually broadcasting in real time vital signs on a large screen using a, uh, a, a piece of simulation software. Um, and you're able to have them work through um, uh, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, uh, you can talk about physiology and impact of medications, and then work through your scenarios in a verbal environment. That has some significant value, especially if you're you're trying to not um, you're trying to understand the cognitive portion and necessarily practical application of. So I wanted to share with you one specific study that ties fidelity into it to give you an idea of where the, this impact has. And this was a study we actually did here at WakeMed. It was done in 2011, and it really did focus on fidelity. We, we intentionally used a trauma scenario, and the primary measure that we did was heart rate. Um, we put 19 air medical providers through it, and we did the demographics uh, of them. It was, you know, 90% of them were younger than 40, 63% of them were male, 37% nursing, and 53% were paramedics. The mean time in practice was about nine years. Um, and you know, we measured their heart rate, taking into consideration caffeine intake, uh, cigarette breaks, and other stimulants that they may have had prior to the study. And the resting heart rate was listed at about 71 beats per minute. 
We started a complex pediatric trauma scenario for them at the start of the scenario. Um, uh, we, we noticed a, a change in heart rate. It, it leveled off. And then just prior to the transport portion of it, we noticed an increase in, the scenario, in their heart rates again. You know, what was interesting was a lot of this anticipatory heart rate uh, during the study uh, intake process. Um, some providers uh, peaked pretty high, and some providers stayed pretty mellow and pretty leveled. One of the most interesting things to me when we did this study was we had uh, some providers with heart rates in the 160s uh, in the course of all of the heightened excitement in the management of the pediatric patient. And so it was interesting to see the variety uh, and, the, and, and the level of realism people had as they went through this. And when we compare this to other studies that measured real-world scenarios to simulation and used other markers, we found that this was actually fairly um, equal to some of the other uh, data that was out there. So how do we move forward from here, and how do we ensure that the education we provide is value-add? And I think it begins with data. It's important for us to understand where our gaps are and where we have opportunities to learn. And in order for us to design a simulation experience that has value-add, it's understanding the foundational stuff, I think, is first. And so quality and performance data, data helps us drive a training program. It helps us understand the need that, that's there. It helps us fund and sustain simulation long term. And it helps us ensure that we have change. If I'm able to show data pre-simulation and post-simulation and the value that simulation adds, it really just makes the argument easier for us to, to, to continue to do simulation-based training. And I think it's also important for asking our learners what they need. Um, we often have this, this 30,000 foot view of what our program needs, and we only use data as the driving marker. It's important to have the talks with your care providers and ask them where should they focus, where, where are the skills that they really need to want to hammer on, what types of calls are they going on that, it, that, they, that they want to really um, do in training. And then conduct a needs assessment and a needs analysis. And yes, they are two very different things. So you know, step one in the process is uh, to do a needs assessment. And a needs assessment really focuses on understanding the gaps. So this provides data, uh, this provides data to you about gaps in results. And you know, by, uh, by defining the need as a gap between current and required results, we're, you know, we're able to, to have a basis for justifying not only where we should head, but also the evidence for, uh, for uh, uh, proving the costs of meeting the need. And you know, we want to get into the right direction, and so this helps us um, uh, ensure there's a balance between need versus want. What's also important is by defining, uh, by defining a need, um, you're able to determine what it should be, which is derived on the basis of performance data, which also becomes your, your objectives for the training experience. And you have basic criteria for an evaluation as you develop your educational program. Uh, and you only have to compare the new distance between what is and what should be based on the needs identified and justified. A needs analysis would be step two in your process. Um, and a needs analysis really highlights understanding the root causes and essential elements of such gaps. So it's, it, it's there to be able to provide you with data on the casual factors of gaps and therefore provides you with input on solution alternatives that should be considered to ensure that you close the gap that you've identified. Two very different things, two extremely important things as you're designing your educational program. So the other thing to highlight here is the educational methodology versus the technology. And I, you know, I want to bring up there are lots of educational theories that are out there tied to simulation. As educators, we kind of need to be comfortable with them in order for us to understand different models and different training uh, elements that help uh, make improvements and sustain education long term for our, for our uh, participants or our students. Um, you know, in simulation, we tend to lean towards Kolb's. Uh, learning uh, cycle, which focuses on doing and having, reviewing experiences, concluding, uh, concluding or learning from the experience, and then trying out what we've learned in the real world situation. We often focus on Knowles or the Dreyfus model. I mean, there are a lot of different educational theories. Get an idea of what works well for your students, what works well for your participants, and really uh, try to focus on those. Not one is the solution to all different things. It's also important for me to point out that the use of simulation in pediatric training is not about the plastic. 
The technology itself is a tool to ensure there is success, and you have to pick the right tool for the training that you're trying to conduct. So if the focus is on airway training as the simplest skill that's out there, great. Start off with the skills training model and build up over time to a complex simulation where they're integrating that. You can really grow their critical thinking skills as a result of that. And sometimes the tool isn't needed at all. Sometimes it's having a discussion, talking through it, doing an oral case study, doing a PowerPoint presentation. Identify where your students' gaps are and work to, to using the right tool for the right piece of education. So there are three avenues for us to really um, uh, look at, and that is the individual, the key experiences, and the learning environment. If we highlight on the individual, uh, in the, you know, individuals are, are, are these, and generally adult learners are, are self-driven, highly motivated to be able to accomplish a task. They have experiences they bring to the table that will often challenge our own thinking as educators. They're highly emotionally charged, and sometimes they are and are not with, okay with mistakes. Um, but for us, it's important to bring out that it's okay to make a mistake in training. It's okay to learn from the mistake, and it's important to reiterate that as we have them go through this experience. Uh, and then the learning environment itself must be appropriate. We must have the right tools in place. You must have individuals that are competent and comfortable in the skills that they're training. The worst thing is having a bad teacher that can't teach pediatric airway skills or IOs training individuals on how to do those skills when they themselves are not comfortable, competent, or confident in those skills. They have to be able to, to, to do this well in, in that clinical setting. I mentioned earlier the combination of lecture versus uh, tutoring or uh, practical skills, and there is a balance that's present. So you achieve mastery level when you mix the two together, and that balance exists um, as you're working through uh, providing that core cognitive education, allowing students to be able to practice and repeatedly practice on the individual skills and then uh, be able to move forward. Scenario design. Uh, so scenario design is um, sometimes it's the easiest thing you can do and sometimes it's one of the hardest things you can do. And oftentimes where we see organizations have challenges with scenarios is the validity portion of it, is validating your scenarios, is running through your scenarios to ensure that, that it is appropriate for the training that you're about to conduct. Um, so, you know, ensure that we have an educational plan in place. What are the objectives? Um, are they smart objectives? Are they specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and timely? What equipment do you need to be able to do the scenario? What gaps are you trying to address? What is the measurement of success? What is the scenario? Um, you know, uh, scenarios often will bring in other elements into the picture. You have confederates who we call actors and standardized patients who are playing different roles. They may play the patient themselves. Uh, how are those individuals tra uh, trained? What types of uh, methods are they using to convey their messages? Is there a written plan? Is there a script in place? And arguably, what's your debrief plan? So scenarios can be really easy to design depending on the case and, and amazingly complex. We encourage you to grow in complexity as the skills and knowledge grow. Again, embrace fear. Fear is okay. Help them evolve and become more confident in the skills that they're maintaining. Um, and then confidence can save you uh, um, or it can kill you. And so it's important that as, as individuals work together and are, are playing together in the scenario that they, ha they listen to each other because that team is important and integral in taking care of our patients. You know, educational failure is often driven by putting somebody in a complex simulation or complex scenario that is mentally or physically not prepared to do so. So taking that, that paramedic student and sticking them in, an, in a mass casualty event, they're, they're not prepared to be there. It's a great way to be able to me mentally and physically break them. And so right scenario for the right individual at the right time is extremely important. You want scenarios that can be simple, that grow in complexity, and you want to balance this classroom based versus in situ versus a clinical simulation lab environment. I'm a huge fan of the ADDI model. Um, for those that are out there, I think you know, analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate is important in simulation. Um, it's a basis for a lot of the work that we do, and it allows us to evolve our educational programs. And so even simple skills based things, if you follow that model, you have great success in moving stuff forward. Um, shared mental models, you know, sharing, uh, shared understanding of what the purpose of the activity and the roles are happens during a, a pre-brief 
and a briefing session. Um, and it's important to do that so that everybody's on the right page and the expectations are very clear. And please keep in mind as you're designing your scenarios, you know, especially in these highly charged pediatric scenarios where people are already emotionally tense uh, in some of these cases, uh, psychological safety is key. Um, and novice students are extremely fla fragile, but at times so are experienced clinicians who have had that bad experience in the clinical setting. So always keep that environment. Education, um, it should be all about safe environments. We talk about Vegas rules. You know, there's lots of questions tied to do I kill my patient or do I not? You know, do they die or do they not? This is not a hazing experience. and We do not deliberately, intentionally change scenarios to make people fail. Um, and, you know, it's important for us to think through that as we work through these different uh, cases. Use, um, you know, workflow changes, human or system processes. There's lots of different things called for skills training. Uh, uh, um, you can do critical thinking training, competency evaluations, just-in-time training. You know, we use them oftentimes for FMEA or RCAs. Um, you can do ergonomics training or even equipment testing. They're all value adds. I encourage you to be able to to think about different ways to use simulation for your training program. The good. So lots of good stuff. You know, simulation uh, closes the gap between the book and the street. It's extremely popular and, and uh, extremely relevant for adult learners. Kinesthetic learners are routinely happy with using simulation. It's extremely flexible, and you can do as uh, you can do a lot with it. Um, and so there's a lot of flexibility that exists with it. Um, and then research shows the value of simulation in many, many different ways. The bad, Dr. Peel mentioned, you know, cost can be a challenge for us depending on what types of, of training tools that you're using. Um, resources can be, can be significantly higher, both space, human resources, as well as equipment. Lack of knowledge uh, is, is a challenge, and people need to be trained on how to do simulation-based training and do it well. Many of us have been doing it for decades. Uh, we haven't been calling it simulation, we've just been calling it education. Um, so now we're going to call it something, you know, and we encourage you to be able to look at some of the, the simulation theories and educational theories that are out there that have value add. You know, time is required to conduct the training, develop the scenarios, establish a process. That can take lots of time. And you know, there was research out there that talks about where you can have problems. And poorly or adequately, inadequately designed simulation is worse than having really no simulation at all. The ugly. You know, there is an ugly point to this, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, simulation done wrong can create a very negative downstream effect. Training scars is my biggest thing. Um, you know, a training scar is essentially a bad habit that, that people are taught during training experience. You know, it's a, 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 um, an article recently that I read that focused on training scars highlighted really four big things. Training as you fight, providing realistic uh, patients, provide realistic scenarios, and provide realistic outcomes. And to be successful, you really have to do those four things in the simulation environment, keeping in mind that if we train bad things, we can have a bad downstream effect of patient harm and patient death, which is not what we get into this to do. The reality, um, we, don't, uh, we don't have the human resources. Uh, we don't all have those resources, so we try to be able to use each other to create those training experiences, and I implore you to be able to do that partner up with folks, there's lots of value in that. Um, we don't have the technology, and I said before, it's not about the plastic. Um, you can use different training tools that allow you to be able to, to get just as realistic high fidelity simulation as if you had, as if you had a high, high fidelity human patient simulator in your arsenal. Um, so use what you got, but, but be, uh, be realistic about it. And, and try to create that environment that allows for individual learners to take education away uh, that is value add. Uh, the money isn't always there either. And oftentimes what we get is, well, I've got to detail somebody to, to a training center to be able to take it, then I've got to backfill their position. That costs money. I get it. We can actually do great training in the back of an ambulance while people are on shift in between calls. Take advantage of that downtime and do some education in between calls. And, there, and the other one I often hear is there is no value in providing education to my providers. They work part-time elsewhere, so let their other organizations handle it for them. The training that they're receiving at their other organizations does not benefit the patients that they take care of in your area. And you can have a completely different patient population that you're trying to manage. It's important to do focused education based on the patients that you deal with on a routine basis in your area. So the connection is this. 
we want you to crawl, walk, run. Start slow, eventually walk, and then run with simulation at a high pace. We want you to practice, practice, practice. And we want you to practice it correctly. And the days of see one, do one, and teach one are gone. And, and if you're doing that, those skills, I would implore you to try to think about different ways to provide education. Uh, we've seen great harm in the see one, do one, teach one model, and we're really trying to get ourselves out of it. Fear is okay and expected. We want you to embrace the fear. We want you to use, uh, use the educational environment to practice and overcome the challenges. And, and simulation and, and creating that simulation environment or that, that oral case study simulation environment is really important in, in being able to be successful. So impactful things, understand the needs, design an educational experience that addresses those needs, know your audience and the purpose of your experience. I implore you to start small. You know, focused skills training can be just as impactful. Um, and really look at uh, um, the technology and be competent in the educational methodologies you're using. Borrow from others, partner when possible, and evaluate success through system impact using a return on expectation or a return on investment model. The future is this. Focus on the learner and the needs of the organization. Do not forget why we are here. We are here to take care of our patients. The impact is driven by a need and a solution. And adopt to change, and innovation is driven by this change model concept. So for the next steps for you is attend an educational program offered in partnership with or through organizations like the Society for Simulation in Healthcare, the International Pediatric Simulation Society, or even the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine. Reach out to your peers. Others are doing this around you. Connect with them, work with them, network with them. Look at accredited programs that are using simulation in their environments and see what they're doing and take, and take those things away. Partnerships are, are key to success. And then validate experiences and knowledge before you jump in to, to others that are trying to do simulation. Um, it's important you have experienced folks training, on, training you on how to do correct simulation-based education. Um, I'll uh, turn this back over to AJ for some questions. That's great, thank you. Um, for those of you online, um, we are going to run over a few minutes. I think we have too many great questions to just leave at the top of the hour, so please hang with us. Um, I'm going to start off, luckily Dr. Peel is here in the office with me, and I'm going to, the first question is ask the impact that video laryngoscopy has on the philosophy of intubation. Right, so um, I feel like video laryngoscopy is like laparoscopy, so we used to do appendectomy is open, and now we have a video-based tool that the surgeons take the appendix out with. It's, there's a steep learning curve with it when it started, and now it's the, the standard of care. Video laryngoscopy has multiple advantages. I can give you an hour lecture on it, but I would say, one, for the younger learners who start out with it, it becomes intuitive and normal. For older timers, like us, you have to learn a new skill, but it facilitates a number of things. Your partner can watch and see what you're doing You can on the screen. You, you have confidence about where the tube went. Esophageal intubation is much less likely if you're watching the tube go through the cords. And I believe that it can be done with adequate sim training in particular in a way that you can still put the tube in undergoing chest compressions at the same time more easily than you can with a regular DL blade. There's just a few of the, a few of the advantages, but I believe, and there's many via, there are many video laryngoscopy products Again, it's hard to know which is best. There are advantages and disadvantages of each, but I believe it's a skill that we should all learn. Okay, the second one I'm going to dove into is the um, the, the peep on the bag valve, yeah. the, the staircase approach of that, if you can explain that yep. to the audience. And again, love to show you more videos on how this works, but peep is basically positive end expiratory pressure. When a child has had a pneumonia, a cardiac arrest, drowning, the air sacs, the alveoli, collapse down, and they need to be reopened for gas exchange to happen. If we just bag <clears throat> without PEEP and, and expiratory pressure, those little alveoli close down with each release of the bag. Whereas, if you leave a little positive pressure at the end of the breath, they stay open and subsequently you can open more. So you actually open up the lung much more effectively and keep it open, exchanging oxygen and CO2 better. Um, you, we should all have a PEEP valve available for our bag valve masks, and many pediatric bags now come with them pre-attached. Someone asked the question, how, what level? I start at five and super sick kids, I'll go up to about 10. Five to 10 is probably completely adequate. Yeah, but definitely should get bag masks and have the people. Absolutely. Into it. 
Absolutely. So, you know, there's, a, there's one here that comes from Clayton County. Great question. How does more on-scene time uh, cause such a great outcome? And I right. think you're going to find that in the Polk County article that's coming out right. next month. Basic skills, vascular access, whether IV or IO, basic medications, and cardiac arrest, epinephrine, for example, airway management at the scene of the accident, so bag valve mask ventilation, supraglottic or endotracheal intubation, and chest compressions. Getting the patient resuscitated first before moving to the vehicle into, into the hospital. Um, I think people are scared of the child. The parents are standing around. There's an audience. I'm not sure I know what to do. And it may seem more comfortable to, to scoop and run. But most of the data is showing that if we manage the basic skills, the critical skills first, and then move, we'll have a better outcome, especially in cardiac arrest. I think it's also been shown that when you respond with not enough resources, you feel even more stress. In Correct. The systems that send almost a second alarm assignment to a pediatric code, some, somebody can be with the parents, somebody can be with somebody else, and, and everything seems to get managed. And we discussed also two-handed bag masking right. if you have the personnel. So the technique I taught is, is for when you're by yourself and you have one hand. Obviously, a two-handed technique um, would work more effectively if you have the people. Um, you can, you can uh, pick off here. There's so many good questions, AJ. Why don't we just run through a few and we'll get to them all. Yeah, that's and, uh, fine. You, you talked about elevating the shoulders. And right. I don't know if there's kind of a standard for that or a, yeah. a, a it's, general guide. There's not a standard. The infants have a large occiput. but the back of their head is bigger, which naturally props the head forward when the child's unconscious laying on the ground. So I just want to align kind of um, like in an adult, the sternal notch to the, to the earlobe and... Uh, you, in, in a child, a little shoulder roll is helpful. There's not a specific guideline on what age or what weight to do that. I kind of look at the child, and it's usually under two years old, but a little shoulder roll will help me. Uh, number 14 here is uh, coming from Mexico. Is it more reliable to insufflate the stomach um, than in the adults? So it can't be noticeable. Um, so insufflation of the stomach is a big problem, especially in infants. So if you're bagging incorrectly with lots of pressure, what, where's the and, and you're and you have a, a in malposition to airway, what happens? The stomach fills with air, the diaphragm is pushed up, there's less excursion then for the lungs available, and you, you result in, in worse outcomes, and you can cause more regurgitation. So, so a, opening the airway effectively with jaw thrust and head tilt and bagging gently will serve to not insufflate the stomach. Um, what about the, the difference between an advanced airway and endotracheal yeah. renovation? I noticed a question about King's. Um, I think an LMA eye gel is probably going to be easier in, in the small child than, obviously, the, the King Airways. And there's, you saw some of the studies which suggested that LMA may actually be superior to endotracheal intubation, especially if the skill is not there. So I, I think it's a great solution. Many agencies are going straight to that as their advanced airway, placing an LMA first, and I think that's totally acceptable. Also requires some practice in simulation, and um, I think it can be super effective. Uh, there was a question in here which I think got both of us about the bean counters. How do we convince them to spend the money? Exactly. So the question, this is a great one. So the question is, how do you convince our administrators to spend the dollars for training when the call volume is almost nothing? And that's kind of what I got at first. Ten percent or less of your of your calls are pediatric, but then they're the most stressful. So you could you you could talk a lot about the different advantages for training kids, and I'll just mention a few that are on my mind. One, it's the right thing to do. We want to take the best care of our smallest patients. If you want to look at it from an economic standpoint, um, years of life, prospective years of life saved um, are greater in children. Liability would be a concern, mismanagement of a child. for the bean counters. Right. Um, and I believe that as you gain confidence in pediatric resuscitation, as Amar mentioned, the stress levels in a trauma scenario, you're going to have more confidence in other stressful situations. So I think it's worth, I think it's, I think the training in pediatrics actually extrapolates to uh, a, larger a, larger, a larger population. It gives you more confidence with other skills. Um, and I would also say that in, in many agencies um, who are dependent on local governments for funding, taking great care of the rare child is going gonna, is gonna to draw positive attention to your agency and, and help, hopefully provide you the resources, you, may provide you the resources you need in, a better, in an improved way. And speaking about liability... Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, so, you know, in addition to that, though, I think, you know, besides the liability and everything else, I think it's important that if you have small organizations 
that don't necessarily have the funding to be able to to afford getting the training, I would I would implore that people partner with other areas. There's a lot of healthcare systems, yes. there's a lot of famous agencies that are doing this and doing it well, and they're right around the corner from you. So instead of spending spending money on on buying tools and stuff, see what see who else is around you and working with them because I think. The, the knowledge is based on experience, and if you're not running a thousand pediatric calls a year, but your next door neighbor is, you know, using their knowledge and their exper expertise will only improve your own system. Not just that, I, I I'm a big advocate of pooling. Um, when I ran some services, uh, if we couldn't afford a particular piece of equipment, sometimes we went in with two or three other services and. If you think about the number of times that you're going to use it, you could rotate a, a good simulator around between two or three services and share those costs. So I think that's important as well. I see a question on how do you do. There's a question on how do you deal with the parents who may be in the way in a, in a difficult situation. And I think going in with confidence that you have basic skills ready to to use um, probably will be the biggest calming effect on the parent. Um, it's a difficult aspect of pediatric care in general, but just saying, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to take the best care of your baby that I can. And and, and this is the other thing we got to work with your police agencies. Yes. Police have a very calming effect on a family like that. And take them in another room, let the paramedics do their thing. It's not like you're asking for more time on scene, but the the police officer can sometimes do that for you. Um, the other area I wanted to get into because I know you're involved with us in the whole sepsis for kids. Um, we are very negligent in this country by taking thermometers off of our ambulances. And so when you're dealing with kids, uh, explain the role of fever and, and pick it up. On it's one of the criteria that you may use to diagnose sepsis and septic shock, and I think it's an essential tool, not a very expensive one. And, and, and the reality is if a child has sepsis, the, the, the odds are they're going to get it again. And so if they just came out of the hospital or six months ago came out of the hospital with a fever, you need to know that and you need to be able to evaluate that, correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, now, it, and, and while we're talking about sepsis, I, you know, it's a shameless plug for you, for me to say this, but you've developed a, a, a tremendous tool called LifeFlow that um, infuses fluid quickly in peds. And can you explain why that fluid infusion quickly is important? In, in septic shock, we our, our most important two tasks are getting antibiotics and fluids in quickly and reversing shock. And we have a lot of trouble doing that, particularly in pre-hospital environments. So. Um, Getting a lot of a large volume of fluid, 60 per kilo or so, through a small IV is difficult. And so we developed a tool that helps you more rapidly and intuitively uh, resuscitate a patient in shock. I call it like the space age squirt gun. Every, <laughs> every squeeze is about 100. 100. Uh, well, it's it's 10 per squeeze, but you can you can put your lead, you you can get it in quite quickly. Yeah, through through almost any access. Um, can paramedics have more experience with real patients within the hospital? Simulation is still simulation. Um, you know, the problem with that is the hospitals don't have a lot of time for you, you know, open for you. Right. To do I, that. I str we struggle with this with our own hospital. I would love to be able to bring uh, uh, folks in uh, to get hands-on experience. And it's just, it, for a variety of reasons, it's difficult to do, but I think it's something worth lobbying for, for sure. In uh, every Amar area but different as well. So I think there's a challenge, you know, there's a challenge with regards to, to space. There's not always all, enough space for all the different students that, that should be able to go to clinicals. What about uh, using auditory uh, to increase the stress and in simulation uh, with, you know, baby screaming, parents screaming in the background? The experience with that, Amar? Yeah, it is one of my favorite tools is both the visual and as, as well as auditory stuff. So if uh, using auditory in this space and having the other distractions only makes the simulation that much more stressful and that much more realistic. So you can easily take a very simple conference room uh, chest pain scenario and turn it into a high stressful simulation experience just by adding distractors throughout the entire space. Uh, it's a great tool. I, 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 we use it routinely for the stuff that we do. Um, you know, one of the scenarios that we do is with our mobile teams, and we have radio chatter going on, and then you have air conditioning noise in the back of the truck. You have the, the sound of a moving vehicle you can have, uh, and it's great to be able to heighten that stress of people arguing or other things. Yeah, and that recently Wake County EMS uh, trained all of their medics in how to deal with uh, the violent or aggressive uh, bystanders or patients, and they actually use police officers to be the, the victims. And uh, 
they found that that was a tremendous uh, tool for them to be able to have somebody who has that kind of experience. Um, Amar, I'm looking at a couple questions here, and one is where can we learn more about simulation and developing the effective training? There are organizations around that uh, do teach that. Um, you know, obviously we're one of them. There's areas, uh, the Wiser Institute in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There's the Gordon Center in Miami. Uh, there's uh, institutions in Texas that do it, out in California that do it. Um, I would also encourage you to look at the Society for Simulation in Healthcare uh, or IPSS or SAEM. Uh, they do provide education. I mean, Harvard Med Sim. There's a lot of organizations that are out there that are providing foundational knowledge in simulation. Uh, some do charge, uh, so there may be an expense added to it as well. Uh, in terms of free uh, resources, uh, there are some through the national societies that are available to people to sign up for. You know, one of the other things to look at is free discussion boards. There's actually the EMS. Um, there's an EMS. Uh, uh, committee as part of the Society for Simulation and Healthcare that is free to join, and you can bounce ideas and questions off of, um, and it's a great resource for EMS providers to jump onto. Yeah, and at, at EMS today, Amar, you were involved with that eight-hour pre-con, and we'll probably do that again. It was uh, very appreciated and, and well attended, so that's another avenue for you. And I, I would also tell people that your state EMS for Children's program can also be very helpful. And, uh, if you don't if you don't tap into that, it's ridiculous because there are a lot of dedicated people doing that. Okay, a couple it's more. A, uh, go ahead, Mark. I was just going to say it's 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 something that's needed in this industry. And for those of you that are out there that are that are that have been doing it a while, please join us. Please share the thoughts and the experiences. It's one that you know many of us would love to get out there to make sure that our peers have the best knowledge and access to resources. Yeah, and Amar, can you give your email address for uh, people to contact you? And then uh, Dr. Peel is ag agreeable to give his as well. Sure. It's um, A is an Apple Patel, P A T E L, at wakemed.org. It should be on the screen now, but um, you see one up there. I'll give you another email address, which is M P I E H L at wakemed.org. And my other uh, work address is on the screen. A couple other quick questions, and then we'll have to, to go. Um, Someone asked, what is the brand of mannequin that was realistic? Both brands we used, one was the Lairdall Tim Baby, and then the uh, LifeCast, um, by, which is now owned by Sindaver, um, or, or two realistic models. Um, someone asked about oxygen, passive oxygenation prior to endotracheal intubation. Yes, 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 always do it. Um, I tend now, in, in my airway courses, not to recommend even using a paralytic so that the patient continues to breathe during the intubation and with the use of ketamine, but that's a higher level skill. But I always use uh, a passive uh, oxygenation. Uh, someone asked, um, what are your thoughts on saline versus lactated ringers and pediatric resuscitation? Both are probably just fine, and there's conflicting data on one versus the other. Uh, either are fine for uh, acute resuscitation. Um, and I think we're going to have to stop, unfortunately. Yeah, by I, the way, we, uh, we'll, send a, we'll, we'll send a few answers out by email to the folks that asked questions that we didn't get to. I just I think, I think I want to conclude by, you know, telling you that um, we often run because we're scared. I had a medical director for 19 years when I was the EMS director, and he was a great guy, and he drummed into us that every single patient deserves your calm, controlled care. He called it the three Cs. Mm -hmm. And going into a call, particularly with something like the Antevi method, uh, it's really sweeping the nation that you are prepared, you understand that you're not going to make any medical errors, and uh, we're going to be doing a follow-up article on the results in San Antonio and Denver where they have virtually eliminated their, their medical errors on pediatric calls with the Hentevi method. So do some research on that. Um, just a, a great doctor and a great person so uh, and a great system that he's developed. Thanks again to all of you for participating today, and particularly to Lairdall, who's been a leader not just in resuscitation, but in particular in simulation and in pediatrics and in infant resuscitation. Uh, they do a great job for all of us, and uh, we greatly appreciate them sponsoring this opportunity for you. Uh, CAPC only. Uh, don't forget to complete the evaluation if you're interested in the CAPC CE, uh, and input your license information to receive your one hour of CAPC approved CE. Uh, you'll be emailed a CE certificate within a few days. Again, we're going to archive this, uh, share it with people. I think there was extremely valuable information. 
And a uh, reminder that only CE credit is for those who attended this live event. So again, I want to thank our uh, two guests today. Uh, great presentation, a lot of good information. I hope you feel a little bit more comfortable about um, attacking these pediatric calls. Uh, they're just another patient. You have to treat every patient the same way. So thanks for attending, and we hope to see you back at another GEMS webcast real soon. All right, guys. We all